Hey, it's Mike Hambright with Flipner.com. Welcome back for another exciting VIP interview where I interview some of the most successful real estate investing experts and entrepreneurs in our industry to help you learn and grow. Today, I'm joined by Jay Massey, who's a real estate investor, a mentor, an author, a father, a husband, a whole bunch of stuff. He's also a fellow podcaster via uh, his show, The Podcast, I'm sorry, The Cashflow Diary. And uh, he's got a, a bunch of other things he does too. He's a great guy. Um, he has an incredible rags to riches story that he's going to share with us here when, as we get started. And he's embraced real estate investing to provide for his family and to share his lessons with others so they can benefit as well. Jay invests in many different vehicles and is pretty much agnostic to what he invests in as long as it makes sense from a cash flow perspective. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today is focus on cash flow instead of whether you're investing in single family, commercial, uh, unique investments of any any sort. So it's going to be an interesting show. Before we get started, though, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of Flipner.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Jay. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have you on. So uh, I love having fellow podcasters on. I think I've had you know everybody that's in kind of the top 10 hottest uh, podcast. Now, you, we save the best for last, maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, you've got a great story uh, to share of how you got here. And I'm so happy to hear you use the words serve a lot because I think that's what a lot of us do is try to teach others what we know. And uh, it, you and I both know, aside from wanting to benefit other people, that if you're not, it's a real lonely business. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, completely. Yeah. <laughs> so much so that we reach out to each other over the internet and try to talk to each other yeah. this way. Yeah. Because we yeah. have no one else to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, why don't you just um, share your, your story so people can get some perspective for those that are listening to my show that don't know you. Uh, yet and may want to tune into your podcast and, and learn more about what you're what you're all about. But tell us your story. Sure. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I were in a situation. I call it. You can call it difficult. I call it uh, a very great learning lesson. Yeah. And for us, what that means is uh, we. I was previously a financial planner. Then we had just had a miscarriage, which you know, in and of itself, my heart goes out to those who have experienced that. But we were pregnant again, and this time we were having additional complications. And it turns out that uh, she was diagnosed with a condition known as hyperemesis. Now, most of you listening right now have never heard of it, and that's okay. It's usually only someone who's had it or someone who is a, in the medical profession in some way. What it means is that she can't eat or drink while pregnant. That was the beginning of a very stressful situation. One day to go blow off steam, I went to go play volleyball. I jumped high, landed on a guy's head, punctured my lung. I was born with asthma. That meant I could not walk and talk simultaneously without fainting. Oh, geez. This led us to going, okay, what are we going to do? I'm a self-employed financial planner. No client I'm aware of wants to come to the hospital to plan their financial future. So we start selling our personal possessions on eBay. Mm. When things uh, start to run out, when your garage gets empty, you start selling your friend's stuff and anything you can find, etc. And what ends up happening is that a friend of mine says, hey, I got a solution for you. Now, at this moment, I was open to just about anything. And he said, hey, you should become a real estate investor. And he knew everything that was going on. I mean, we had a credit score of 398, and I got those numbers in the correct order, by the way. And what happened is, in no short words, amazing, in my opinion. What that means is that we, we started. We started with a strategy known as wholesaling. I eventually did some note brokering, and I hold some notes now still. Uh, we've got a decent size, mostly family portfolio. We've been able to do hundreds of transactions, buy and sell type transactions across many different states. Been able to develop an incredible team on the real estate side, learning to develop that same style, incredible team on our marketing and education side to help people be able to duplicate cash flow because cash flow can be created 
from wherever you just have to understand how to build the asset and then sell it absolutely and probably probably the most important thing to understand is that all this started in 2008 when most people said hey everything was falling apart and it was yeah but one of the secrets in my opinion is to understand that where there's chaos there is cash flow and to learn to look for that chaos so that you can go out there, build an asset, and solve some problems. Absolutely. Hey, Jay, why, why don't you elaborate a little bit on your situation there? Because there's so many successful real estate investors that I know, and really people that are successful in a lot of walks of life, that finally achieve success when they were faced with a lot of adversity, right? Like failure is not an option. There's a point in your life when that happens. And the same thing happened to me. It was nowhere near as dramatic as your situation, but I was new husband, new father, and I left my cushy corporate job and my wife who made more money than me had left too. And just failure, failure was not an option. And uh, so, but I hear that over and over again when talking with a lot of experts in real estate, because that's primarily what I do, is that most of them got to a point in their life where it, failure just was not an option. Well, and I'd like to, if I can, restate what you said. Yeah. It's not that failure, wasn't an option. Well, yeah. It's just an option we didn't choose. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it cuz it's always an option. Sure, you can choose sure, to sure. fail at any moment. You can turn this podcast off, never listen again, and I promise you you're probably on the way to failure if you stop the habits that lead to success. Yep. At the end of the day, sometimes we need an excuse to step into the greatness we were originally born to be. And for some of us that means our life has to get worse. And for others of us, it means our life gets better. In my book, one of the things that I discuss is this exact same principle, because some people out there wait until like me, you're like me, you wait till something, the bottom falls out, then you get your button gear. Yeah. And other people out there find another way to go out there and make things happen without waiting for things to, to bottom out. And there's a technique and skill set that can be trained to learn how to do that. What's really key to understand is that we all have to have a reason to raise our standards. Yep. And sometimes when the bottom falls out, that's when we go, well, it can't get any worse, so I might as well try. Yeah. And whatever it's going to take for you to go out there and try, please do it. Because those are the things that, that begin to create. Those are the hero stories. Those are the people that we admire. Those are the people that overcome every obstacle. And you, you can't give me an excuse. You, can't, you shouldn't have an excuse. For example, and your excuse is valid only if no one else on the planet has ever overcome it. Yeah. As far as I know, nearly every excuse has been overcome. Absolutely. So therefore, it can work for you too. Yeah. And, and given that there's so many real estate investors that kind of never get out of the gate, you know, there tend to be a lot of people in real estate investing that are doing this part time in addition to another <laughs> job or another business right. or something right. else. And do you feel that, and there's a lot of, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of failure in our industry and failure, not meaning that they got wiped out, but that they just, i in my impression, failure for most is they never got started uh, <laughs> and, and it's because they make excuses or whatever, but maybe it's because they didn't feel that pressure to succeed because they had a comfortable job somewhere, which right. in, in my experience without, I don't want to go into my story here. I told it before, but I left a very, I, I was I guess I, I got fired. I shouldn't say I guess I got fired from a very cushy job for a large company that everybody knows. Sure. And I thought the sky was the limit. The problem is I was tied to a person that got uh, clipped and then I was his right hand man. And so I'm next. Then I went to a startup that was flying high and that didn't turn out well either because 18 months into flying high, they filed bankruptcy. And it was just this realization of I'm not I'm not safe. There's no such thing as a safe job anymore. And I think so many people don't realize that until it's too late. Well, there, and the, here's the, here's the great thing. The, the lie is that we actually believe there was a safe job at one time. Yeah. It was always at the whim of someone else. Now I'm not saying there's wrong, anything wrong with being an employee. Some people absolutely should be, but many of us are just not cut out for it. And it took me decades to realize I was a horrible employee. Yeah. I mean, horrible employee. <laughs> But I didn't know any other option. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think all of us are looking for an excuse to actually become something more. We dream about it. We think about it. And I think you're right. It's, it's comfort kills dreams is what I often tell people. That's comfort true, yeah. kills dreams, yeah. period. And you, you, we want to go from, you know, California to New York, but we won't let we won't cross California border because we're like, oh, it's warm over here and I might have to go through some rough terrain to get to where I want to be. 
And we, we won't leave the comfort of what's familiar for the perceived uh, the, the perceived anxiety or fear or danger of what is unfamiliar. And at the end of the day, what is unfamiliar is exactly what you're seeking. We're all seeking to exceed our present place in various different forms. It just so happens that real estate is where that benefit or where that came live for me. Yeah. You know, and to be very clear, I, I don't necessarily like real estate. I like the benefits that real estate provides. And that's very, very key to understand. There are certain package of benefits that real estate has that nothing else on this planet has, in my opinion. Yeah. Therefore, I pursue it. I mean, if spoons had the same benefit as real estate, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding you, Mike. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about spoons today. No, I understand. I understand. Uh, and I think that's a great way to look at it. I'm, I'm very much the same way. I think a lot of people probably are surprised to hear that. And uh, there's a lot of you know wholesalers or big name people out there that basically have found a way to make re real estate is their life. And for me, real estate is just a platform from which I'm able to accomplish things that I want to do at Correct. this point and hopefully teach others. But there are other passions I have in my life and I know you do too. Well, it sounds like everything that you just talked about, it was a perfect feeder into why you're agnostic to what you're investing in. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's so many of us that are taught or led to believe that they need to just go kind of what I'll say deep instead of wide focus on something you're really good at, which in my case is fa single family. But I'm always, um, it, I always admire people that have found a way to invest across lots of different categories and be successful with that. But everything you just said is it's not about the real estate. It's about the benefits that I get from it. And I can get benefits from these other things too. So kind of talk about the ability to do that successfully, to think about an investment as uh, a cash flow opportunity instead of what it actually is physically. Got it. Well, one of the things that I often try to share and drive home to people is that the first and most important thing is to understand whom you are serving. You can serve uh, many people in different ways. For example, if I take three companies, Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom, all three of them sell similar items. We'll call them shirts. Now, I didn't say go get your shirt from Nordstrom or Walmart or Target. I don't really care. The point is, is that when Walmart, Target, or Nordstrom sell a shirt, they all produce revenue and make money. So therefore, it's not about the money. You can't chase that. What you're really deciding between is, who do I want to serve? Walmart's not concerned about Nordstrom and how many shirts they sell. And yet, Nordstrom is not concerned about how many shirts Walmart sells because they're serving different people. Yeah. When you approach your real estate the exact same way, well, guess what? Single family houses serve a certain person. And guess what? In every neighborhood, there's the Walmart single family houses, and then there's the Target style single family houses, and then there's the Nordstrom style single family houses. Yeah. Same thing with commercial. Commercial buildings uh, serve a completely different person. Sure. And guess what? There's Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom style commercial buildings as well. All of this applies all the way across the board. We focus, we go deep on cash flow. It's just that so many different instruments can produce cash flow. I mean, something as simple as a book produces cash flow for the author. Something as simple as a podcast can learn to become an asset and produce cash flow in that way. Yeah. The thing that we miss is you, we all think it takes money to make money, which is true. The problem is it's the definition of what you and I have been taught to call money is the issue, meaning nobody has a money problem. Every one of us have an idea problem. And when we learn to package our ideas and distribute them in some cases in real estate or be that a cell phone tower, be that a commercial building, be that a book or a course or a podcast, that asset is then what we learn to sell and produces the cash flow. Yeah, that's great. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, as we sit here kind of late 2014, there's a lot of markets around the country. Most markets around the country are from an event. It's gotten harder to buy single family houses, I'll say, um, and the, because the market's hot. And uh, sure. so a lot of people are feeling that tighten up. What I've been thinking about lately is um, how I admire, because I meet a lot of people in the process of the show and some other uh, masterminds and groups I'm part of just sure. how uh, great it is that some of them, for example, invest in other markets. They're still single family, but they invest in multiple markets. That yep. allows them the ability, the processes they've built that allow them to effectively do that in multiple markets has essentially lowered their risk because if one market feels like it's too hot, I'm gonna go play in another sandbox 
for a while. I'm going to go somewhere else where it's not as hot. Or sometimes we shift gears and say, I'm going to focus on uh, keeping more houses as rentals instead of wholesaling because I'm paying too much for houses. It's hard to wholesale them now or whatever that might be. You have to, as a successful real estate investor, find ways to ebb and flow with the market. But um, I haven't thought much until we started talking about going into totally different real estate categories, which makes total sense. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. Why don't you talk a little bit about um, how you're able to kind of manage that without that necessarily becoming more of a generalist instead of a specialist, I guess. Yeah, that did, and that's all. My entire goal is to be the dumbest person in the room all the time. <laughs> and it, when I succeed at that, I am a very, very happy and peaceful man. Uh, when I don't, then I've got tons of stress because it's all on me. <laughs> so that's a long way of saying you've got to learn how to uh, attract and retain quality talent and a team. It's not about me. If it was just about me, it would be a mess. I am I, I'm that guy that that does fire, fire, aim, fire, fire, aim. Then I get ready. Yeah. I need people around me who can pick up the details and run with it and see things through to past completion and make sure that the customer experiences everything that it needs to be. I, I don't speak every language. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, as a generalist, I, I have to learn to speak things like attorney. I have to learn to speak CFO. I have to learn to speak a bookkeeper. I have to learn to speak accountant. And yes, those are different language. I've got to learn to speak investor as well as tenant. Uh, I've got to learn to speak all kinds of different languages. Yeah. And one of the languages I don't speak is government. When you start affecting, I mean, one of our largest complexes is over 150 units. And let's just say that we have a personal relationship with a lot of government entities because of that. I don't speak that language, but we need that relationship in order to make those properties work. The point is, I can't speak everything, I can't do any everything, and you shouldn't be doing everything. And if you design your company, the main thing that I see when I'm working with people, the reason that they can't actually execute in multiple different markets is because they don't have a team that can help them execute in multiple different markets. One of the most important things, you know this, is due diligence. You don't even know what questions to ask and let alone questions to ask in a different marketplace right. and how to have a checklist and make those things happen. All I'm saying is, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that if, if, if you're not concerned about who gets the credit, you can get a whole lot more done. And we together have been able to serve a lot of people. And that's what allows us uh, to play in so many different marketplaces and sandboxes, as you call them. Yeah, yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, about the team aspect of that, of, of how you find people that can help in each of those areas. And a lot of new real estate investors, uh, and not that this not that our show is all about new real estate investors, we have plenty of veteran folks, but they struggle with, um, you know, we're often not able to have a lot of redundancy. So if you, you don't have multiple layers of people that are a backup. So if somebody's out sick or that person gets right. hit by a truck, you know, right. you as the owner, many times you have to step in because there's nobody else to do it. But talk about the importance of kind of how you've built your team out to cover the areas that you want to and still feel uh, a level of sanity that, you know, you can get things done in the event that something happens to them. Yeah, absolutely. And it, here's what it comes down to is that you do only that. This is throughout the entire company. I tell everybody, do only that which you do best and we will hire out the rest. Mm -hmm. Meaning, let me know if there's something we are asking you to do that you don't do best. Let me know. We will find a person or persons to make sure that that uh, item gets handled by them. And th those are a number of things. So obviously everything starts with me, but what it comes down to is if, when you compartmentalize the entity that you're building, it makes it easier. Who's your sales department? Who's your marketing department? And yes, they're different. Who's the communications department? Who's the customer service department? Who's going to fill these specific roles when it comes to your business is what you must do. And you got to begin to release uh, the control of those types of things. Now, that doesn't mean that other, it, because some of them, like customer service, for example, we have a system, an electronic system that allows the emails to come in and anyone can log in and answer those questions. It's very simple in that way. Uh, when it comes to the financial department, we've got a, a CFO. We want to also have a CFO who has an assistant, but that assistant plays, uh, you know, backup for her as well as the operations manager so that the operations manager is the one who's in over a lot of our rehab and construction projects as well as working directly with the property managers so on the real estate side 
that's the general overview of the structure. There's an internal team and the external team. All of those things work together through, you know, communication to eventually flow up to me so that any large decisions can be made. If there's anything I see that the small entrepreneur is guilty of, is holding too much control, being afraid of their little baby, yeah. their precious. Oh, they're not <laughs> going to take care of it as well as I would. You're right, but you've got to learn that 80% is good enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. That is tough. Um, so talk about, like for uh, newer, because I know you, you provide a lot of coaching and mentoring to folks. Talk about for new real estate investors that are just a one man or a one woman band, how they get from that point to kind of building out a team over time how do you i mean got it the first and most important person in my opinion is going to be that financial person uh so maybe you need to start with a bookkeeper and then you've got to get to an accountant and then you eventually have to get to the point to where you have a cfo and if you don't understand the job duty differences between them i completely get it i didn't either but in, in very crude terms, a bookkeeper is just going to put the numbers in QuickBooks. An accountant is going to make sure that those numbers are in correctly. And then the CFO is not only going to make sure that the numbers are in correctly, but he or she is going to help you with the uh, finances of the future. Because accounting only has to do with what has happened. And you as an entrepreneur need help with what you want to also accomplish and to put things on wedge schedules, especially when you're doing uh, when you're doing forward projections on what it comes down to uh, on a larger complex or the building or the investment that you're building and how that revenue is going to flow, you, you need that CFO who can help you with that. Yeah. That person is by far the most important and first one you should go for. Second, and, and let me also underscore this by saying I did 90 plus transactions without having done any of that. And then I had to recreate a number of transactions and a number of years worth of, of tax returns, which was not the way to yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> Cost me of well over six figures to do and get that straightened out with that three letter organization, the IRS. Yep. So I, that's why that's why I'm so uh, adamant that that's the first person. Then what uh, the second person, and, and it might seem a little counterintuitive, and you should do it. You probably are already at this stage. In fact, if you're watching this and if you're looking and you're like glued and listening, you are probably already at this stage where you need an, an executive assistant. Mm -hmm. And in this category, you get what you pay for. You don't even realize how much time you're losing going back and forth, trying to schedule something, chasing people down. You don't even understand how much time that takes to make happen and happen effectively. Your highest and best use is out there finding more deals, creating more assets, building a business, building, uh, creating jobs, and providing clean, safe, affordable housing. Anything that's not related to that, you should not be doing. And that may mean you gotta come out of pocket first for that executive assistant, but here's how I look at it. Everybody on the team has to pay for themselves. Offensive people, sales, marketing, they have to bring in more revenue than they cost you. The defensive individuals, basically operations, executive assistants, everyone else, they have to save you more money than they cost you so that you can go out there and increase your time. And here's the number one thing I've coached a lot of people to do and suggest that they do to make sure that they begin to increase their standards so that they can think clearly. Set yourself a new minimum per hour standard. I recommend everybody start with $500 an hour and say to yourself, I only do that which earns the company $500 an hour. And if it doesn't earn the company $500 an hour, I don't do it. That doesn't mean it, it doesn't get done. It means I don't do it. Mm -hmm. Asking yourself that question repeatedly time and time and time again over enough period of time, you will begin to go, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this and I shouldn't be doing this. And if you begin to only focus on that which earns $500 an hour, that creates more than enough room to bring on quality talent and most importantly has you focused on only those things that are your highest and best use. Yeah, that's boy, that, that that's a lot of great information packed in the last few minutes there. So thanks for sharing that. 
Um, why don't you, because uh, we're, we're getting, we've having maybe another five to ten minutes of the show here. <laughs> as we talked about, as a fellow podcaster, you know that you're like, yeah, you look at, you got to look at the clock a little bit, and you're like, oh man, I, I don't even want it. To, I don't want this to end. But right. um, talk a little bit about we talked about being agnostic to what you invest in. So sure. talk about, I mean, at some at some level, you have to market or pursue opportunities in a certain space. Um, talk about how you are able to focus on a variety of different you know, potential investment vehicles and uh, how you can do that well. Like, for example, you said you invest in a cell phone tire, but are, are you actively marketing to try to buy or do land leases or whatever for cell phone towers? Or is that just something that just popped in your lap and you said, ah, oh, that makes sense, let's do it? No, I had been pursuing a cell phone hmm. tower for a number of years okay. before we actually got one. Okay. Uh, so it, it what it comes down to is that a lot of my marketing strategy is counterintuitive and is relationship based. Yeah. I don't. I'm not the guy. You don't come to me and say, "Hey, Jay, teach me how to do this yellow letters and marketing." Yeah. Remember, refer to how I got started. I got started with a credit score of 398. Didn't have 75 dollars to put together. And we, so we didn't have a marketing budget. Mm. I had to learn how to go out there and generate referrals and create relationships and create what I call true credit, not this thing managed by a FICO score, and go out there to be able to attract the deals to me at the end of the day. Because I, I know it may be difficult for some to believe, but I am naturally an introvert. And it's not <laughs> something I like. I, it's not fun for me to strike up a conversation that that is that takes work. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to leverage the most out of every conversation and opportunity that I ever got. And I just learned lots of techniques to develop quality relationships that bring these things to me. It's amazing when you let some people know that, hey, here's what I'm up to and here's what I would like to have happen. And here's how you could play if you can help me, how quickly those resources find you. And when you develop that message far and wide and learn to spread it every time, everywhere you go, a lot of the resources that all of us are seeking and pursuing actually end up finding us. Yeah. Uh, some of our best lead generation sources have come from relationships uh, and and counterintuitive ones. Let me give everybody a quick one. Sure, right here. Yeah. If you if you guys are out there looking for the beat up property and you want to make sure that you have a way to get that beat up property before everybody else. This is one of the strategies I'm telling you. It's counterintuitive because right now you probably have a negative relationship with this entity. I'm going to tell you to go talk to code enforcement. They know where every beat up bad property is, period. And as you, we've developed a positive relationship with them and we will occasionally get calls saying, hey, do you want this one? Can you please help us? Because this guy who currently owns it is not exactly uh, the, the landlord. We want to own it and we know what you guys do. Yeah. When you develop that kind of relationship with code enforcement, that would work. Same thing with public adjusters. So yeah, now I'm telling you to chase fires. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because oftentimes when a fire happens, the owner may not want to go through the process of rebuilding. They don't have the systems in place to do that. Right. But you and I, we do. It's what we do every day. Yeah. And the first person to hear those words is the public adjuster going, wow, I wish I had someone to refer you to. Well, they can if you reach out to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that, and a lot of that is not intuitive. And a lot of that stuff, too, is I think it's, you know, it's gotten way too easy for people to sit behind a computer and, and try to run a business and back to the kind of fire in your belly. Don't right. make, don't let success, don't let failure be an option. Um, going out and beating the bushes to find those people and to chase them down and to meet with them and whatever it is, that that takes work. It's a lot harder than yep. saying, here's a spreadsheet of 10,000 addresses. <laughs> Let me push a button and order some mail. So. Correct. I yeah. never, never have done that. I don't have any, I don't know how to do that well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm not that patient to send a letter. I'd rather get on the phone and talk to you. Yeah. So I'm going to track you down that way. But yeah, you can't just, this is not a push button business. This is a people business. Yeah. And the major reason most people are uh, having trouble finding properties is because you're looking for properties. What you should be looking for are problems. If you find problems and people, people come with problems. And when you become known as the problem solver, people will track you down. Hey, I got a problem. Help me. And here's the real estate involved. That's the key yeah. to your deal flow and lead generation. That's great. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit about your uh, your book and how folks can learn more about uh, about you and all the great stuff you're doing. 
Sure. Uh, obviously, the main website is cashflowdiary.com. If you're interested in the podcast and you really, really like this style of talk, uh, you can go to cashflowdiarypodcast.com. And the book, as I referred to earlier, is where I talked about the process of you know raising your standards and making sure that you don't wait till the bottom drops out, etc. And most importantly, there's a technology that I developed called the Profit Analysis Quadrant, which has helped many people. I, I've got one student who's raised over $2 million using this pre, uh, thing in the last few months, and it's been amazing to watch him do it. And it's obviously, it's allowed me to do the same thing because you hear people say all the time, you could do a deal on the back of a napkin, but they never show you how. And what I did is I reduced the, all of that uh, information, my hundreds of units and millions of dollars of capital raised to one book. And what I'm doing uh, for your audience is they have an opportunity to grab a copy of that book at absolutely no cost. Awesome. All we're asking is that they pay shipping. So you can go to cashflowdiarybook.com and you'll pay $7.99 shipping anywhere in the world. Yes, international. This applies to you guys too. It is going, the book will come to you. And that way you can begin the process of creating uh, what I like to call your million dollar day. And we'll eventually get to the point to where you actually have one of those. That'd be cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, a lot of great knowledge, chock full, a half hour packed full of a couple hours worth of content maybe. So, yeah. hey, thanks so much for uh, sharing all your great information with us today. Thank you. All right. Appreciate your time. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Until next time. All right. Bye-bye. Are you a member of FlipNerd.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence, where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market? You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit FlipNerd.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to FlipNerd.com. Thank you.